So language can only dig us so far. <clears throat> and in order to experience the self, we have to go beyond language. So that means that we should be using language and concepts in order to unravel or break down our pre-existing concepts. But then we have to come to the edge and dive in. And language is still going to be uh, a limitation on the experience of this wholeness. So for this reason, then it's important that we can skillfully use language to undo our binding or conditioning, but not get to the point where the language becomes additional bondage. This is why meditation is the perfect complement to any of the other practices we may do involving uh, expression, because it's creating a stable connection with the source beyond language. So this is why all the great masters stress the silence so much. <clears throat> because as long as we're projecting our ideas from the past and about our primitive understanding of reality, and we're trying to find answers to these misunderstandings, then it's creating a cycle of trying to get out of these traps that we create that don't really exist. And then we can spend so much time just doing that so it's important to use the teaching in words then to come to the level of silent teaching. And most of the great yogis and masters would teach mostly in the silent teaching, which is where that through a process of inner revelation, but without any specific words or instructions. So the silence The silence itself is the greatest teacher. The silence is like the seed. The seed is containing everything. It contains the whole tree, it contains the whole forest. Yet, if we break open the seed, then there's nothing inside. So the silence is containing all thought, all language, all sound, all vibration in its seed form, in its unmanifest form. So the, by connecting, by merging into the seed of silence or ocean of silence, then we become filled with all of the words and languages and ideas. But we don't need to identify or hang on to any specific ones. Instead, we can relate directly to the silence. And then in any given moment, when some kind of knowing or understanding is necessary, then it's coming automatically. <clears throat> so in this way, we see the silence is useful for so many things. Also useful for purifying the 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 neurotic and distracted mind. All the time we go on feeding the mind with our constant talking and nonsense, the same habits and patterns and reactions and likes and dislikes over and over again. And so we keep feeding the beast. So with silence, at least we're not feeding it as much. You know, internally, of course, we're still narrating and uh, commenting on what we like and dislike. But it starts to slow down this process of agitation, of mental agitation and overexertion. So the silence is also one of the key mechanisms of purification or of cleansing. The same like fasting is a method for purifying or cleansing the gross body and the cells and the subtle body and the nervous system and also the willpower and heart and mind. Right? This, Restricting what we're 
used to indulging in. Now we're now it's not like we just eat to sustain our bodies or talk to express necessary information, but we're completely indulged in the sense reality, in the sense expression and such. And so in this state, it's very difficult to have the concentration and awareness because of all the distraction. So the silence <clears throat> counterbalances by restricting the talking that we're used to and ad addicted to, then it brings up all kinds of uh, resistance in the ego and the willpower and in the emotions and the mood and the reactions of the mind. So it's very useful that we get to explore and experience ourselves at this deep level of resistance instead of getting what we want all the time this convenience and ease same with the fasting with food we're used to eating anytime anything we want any quantity so when we restrict that those basic aspects of life then it creates the conditions for awareness for deeper awareness so this deeper awareness is necessary to live in the present moment Otherwise, we're caught in our stories and fantasies uh, and, <clears throat> and we go on repeating it. So the silence also is a way to get out of the cycle of samsara. So, so many benefits from the, the great teachings to the saving energy also, conserving energy. So much energy is used producing a physical sound and also uh, calculating what kind of speech patterns and sentences and responses and information. So in the silence then all of that energy that's being used is like we're turning off the refrigerator and the blender and the television. So it's less noise also at the level of consciousness. <clears throat> These are all this all this training is necessary to come to a state of clarity where we're no longer perturbed or distorted by all these ideas and expectations and desires from the past. But in the same way that the self or consciousness is no different from matter, then the silence is no different from sound. Sound is just silence in a manifesting in a particular way. So eventually, then it becomes that we don't need to go hide in the cave or go into some other place to find silence. But in every moment, even with sound and talking and noise and action and, uh, and this movement, still we are deeply merged in the silence at the center of the being. So we can say the asana <clears throat> or the seat of con consciousness, the, seat, the center of the being is not identified with the surface personality and the little successes and failures and memories of the, of the small self and the ego personality but instead is resting in this deep, in the seat of silence at the core of the heart. So when we can gather our attention and, and to relax our attention at this center of awareness, then every moment is an expression of silence. Every gesture, every sound, every word. No longer do we have to come back to the silence, but we are experiencing that silence and that wholeness through every aspect of the uh, individualized material consciousness. So this silence <clears throat> is synonymous, of course, with being, which is synonymous with the present moment and the self. We can say all of these are the same, like love. Also, this silence is love. This silence is wisdom. This silence is power. It's not that it has the quality of something else, but its very nature. We say swarupa, of its very own nature, then the silence is wisdom, is beauty, is power, is being, is presence. 
So this is why it's recommended to choose one way and keep going. Because through any way we will come to the same core, the same source. But it will always be experienced and expressed in different ways. It can never, it's impossible that it would be experienced and expressed in the same way. By the very nature of expression and experience being that of a particular individual using the limited sense perception and conceptual framework based on the past and conditioning language space and time and such so so in truth we can't answer then is the the is the is it the same or is it different because again sameness and difference are at the level of duality and when we're talking about that which is beyond duality then it's also beyond a difference or sameness so we can't say so we could say at the same time of course yes it is the same or also yes it is different or yes it's neither the same nor different or it's both the same and different we can we could argue justifiably argue any of those points but it's even beyond all of that as well so for that reason <laughs> we have to admit of kind of two different laws or two different um, reasoning from the plane of ultimate truth and of relative truth so on the relative plane of course then we say there's differences in the experience because each person experiences anyway we go to watch the same movie or eat the same hamburger we're going to have different experience we could say is that hamburger really the same are two different hamburgers made by the same place using the same ingredients the same or different we can also investigate that but still we eat them and for sure we have different experience also we both pick up a trumpet and we're going to play something different even if we try to play the same thing it's going to come out different so the expression and experience then there's an inherent difference and that's only accentuated by difference in culture for example if i were born in in africa and you were born in the nordic countries then already our experience would be different let alone if we have a certain language and tradition and lineage and habits of things that we do during the day Whatever we do during the day is shaping, directly shaping our brain, our nervous system, and our patterns of interaction. So if what we do every day is wake up at four in the morning and sit still like, a, like an empty log, you know, and then we bow for like an hour and we do these different practices, then that's going to shape our expression of, the, of realization. Not in not that any shape or form or expression and it has to be expressed in some way <clears throat> and so there it's not that there's any way out of a pattern of expression or means of expression so the expression will be shaped by the culture and the framework and the lineage and the daily activities and the experience also will be shaped in many ways by these same factors but the, that which we are really talking about, the realization or the self, we can't say anything specifically or directly about that. Because any condition or quality is in a limitation or a perspective but the, its very nature is that it's a wholeness, that there's no longer this subject-object dichotomy or perceiver-perceived and perception. So beyond that, beyond perception, you know, it's like saying, what is the perception beyond perception? Which is essentially, again, this, this kind of koan or paradox, what was your true face before you were born? It takes us to that place beyond language and only when we surrender to that not knowing, that, that deep not knowing, then is the being. Then we're in a state of being. As long as we insist on knowing, as we're still holding back for some kind of 
word or idea or cause, then we won't be able to fully merge into the unknown. And the self or reality is essentially and inherently unknown and unknowable. So our effort in knowing, this is why we have to be careful, our effort in trying to know is useful to the point that it allows us to break down our habit of knowing. Our knowledge and ideas and concepts can be used to break down our habit of conceptualizing and our conditioning from childhood. Much of our conditioning, our, our understanding about life and ourselves has been inherited from a time before we were able to process the information and passed down to us by largely unenlightened people, the teachers, the television, the advertising, our parents, our friends. So we have to work through so many layers of this conditioning. So the thought and language and doubt uh, can be used for this, but once we get to a certain point, we have to leave a language behind and jump off, jump off of the pier into the ocean. And then it's, we are reality. There's no way to separate it and, and understand it, but only to be it, to live it. That's why we call it a dance, because there's no dance, there's, there's no dance or dancer. We can't separate the dancer and the dance. We can't say, here's the dance, there's not the dance. Such is the present moment or life. There's no separation between the, the expression of life and life itself. So this uh, dancing is uh, unknown. Some dances we know which moves are next. We're not talking about the square dance here, where it's like a do si do and then change your partner and like this. This we're talking about the the dance of the of the elements and the stars and the wind and the river <clears throat> and the soil and the cells and all of this. So awakening, which is often heralded as some grand achievement or some ultimate success even is after all the most ordinary uneventful mundane state and yet Along the way, we have to have this strong drive and desire for realization. So it's an incredibly sticky situation that we're in. And the funniest part is that the one who's trying to get the realization has to disappear and then the realization is. So it's very tricky because we're building up like I want enlightenment or I will have realization or I will be humble, I will be calm. And much of the path and the practice and our way of understanding what we're doing and making sense of it and giving it value is has to do with reinforcing and building up this I as the one who's going to do it. But the doing it is not a doing, it's a non-doing. And when that I gets out of the way, then the enlightenment or the realization or this state of wholeness is remembered as that which always was and has been and will be the case. And that I can't, the I cannot become realized, but can only get out of the way and stop blocking the sun. You know, it's like the cloud is not going to start shining the sunlight, but the cloud can get out of the way. And then the sun, which was shining anyway, which has always been shining day and night, 
uh, in the summer and in the winter and when it's cloudy and raining still the sun is shining so the role of the cloud is not to turn into a sun the role of the cloud is to dissolve to dissipate back into the pure sky that's the realization but most people are trying to turn the cloud into a sun yeah <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> that was a good one yeah um it's good to let you talk but also i had questions yeah yeah yeah, yeah some questions or something um just on the last point that you're talking about because mm. that's all i remember right now <laughs> mm. um the uh the cloud that you're referring to uh is it is it the the ego self or is it the experiencer and the the question i'm asking is because mm. it's scary to me when you talk about the person the one that wants to awaken disappears mm. when before the awakening happens yes that's the death that's is it is, is that person that disappears is that the the egoic self the little self or is that the experiencer itself you understand what i mean yes is there is there an experience of that does one experience the dissolving of the limitation if we say does one experience the dissolving mm. then mm. then it's it's harder to answer that question because the who is this one that experiences mm. but is there an experience of it is it experience is it in the realm of experience uh, the well in the same way that we have a piece of paper with lots of writing mm. and it's within a realm that there's there's something there and then there's the blank piece of paper mm. right so we can know like the when we're when there's a silence and then someone plays a note or there's sound we can we know that there's something now before there's there's something that's creating a a experience or something like this so in the same way uh, in our internal We call landscape. Then we sh we must know when it's like a clear sunny day, or when it's cloudy and rainy, and all this is going on. Then, mm, but the question you're asking is, who is the knower who is knowing this? Not who is the knower, but is uh, there a knower that's knowing it? Is there no? It's I don't like that way of saying the question either because a knower mm, implies an entity. Yes, right. Um. So, I uh, mean, are we talking about the witness and observer consciousness? Yeah. <clears throat> is that still there? Because it's hard to it's hard to imagine that going away and then there being an awakening. It's it's um. What I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to tease apart these two ideas of mm. uh. You say that. The, the one who wants to awaken must disappear before the awakening happens. Yes. But is that one that you're talking about, is that um, the self, the individualized self that, that you're talking about? Or is that the actual experience or the consciousness? No, the individualized self. Oh, okay. Yeah, the consciousness remains stable. Right. There, are sta there, are, there are depths at which even the consciousness goes back into the seed form, we can say. I mm. mean, in the... In the yeah. But what's the, what's the value of that? With the, the consciousness to go back into the seed form, then there's no experience at all, right? Or is there? Well, well it's the it's all it's all experience and no experience. I mean, it's it's uh, it's the infinite fertileness or ripeness that's not you know like a pregnancy that's that's containing everything but not yet. But again, these are now we're talking about questions of time. So in this in this state, it's all simultaneous time. So it's not like there's any urgency or or anything like that. Everything is according to its own mechanism or according to its own dharma in terms of the manifestation. But the the benefit of of uh, we call uh, what's it involution or coming back into that state of seed awareness is that. It, it like recalibrates and programs the system and tunes it to like a super level and that, thus coming back and bringing back all of that one is able to act in a much more mature way we can say but is that experience of involution of uh, maybe you could say dissolution into the uh -huh. into the one awareness of existence mm. um, 
is there an experience of that or is it is it almost like unconsciousness is it almost like you know get knocked out or is it more like there is an experience there it's just very subtle yeah i think that it's like it's like this like like same for someone who's never played classical music and they go to listen to a classical concert then they're going to hear it in a certain way maybe more a surface way they can't pick apart all the details and all the stuff that's going on inside they've got an impression like oh it was nice or it was warm or something it was loud and so but if they were to continue and to study and to study the genres and the music and to listen more and more and to spend more time then they would have more discrimination into the subtleties of what's going on mm. so the same with the inner worlds and these planes beyond the the state of egoic identification and expression with the senses i mean even that we're mostly unconscious about the mechanisms going on in our speaking and listening and and experiencing and mem and, and remembering and all of this but especially the subtle inner dynamics of these states of dissolving or realization or like that are even less familiar at first. But those who have dedicated their, who spend their days uh, it, it, listening and experiencing that and exploring that, then we, one becomes finely attuned. The same like a massage therapist. If you just go to massage someone, you don't feel anything, but someone who's been massaging for years, they know exactly where the person's moving and how the energy and the organs. Mm. So it has to do with a, a familiarity. Hmm. But um, it, I guess uh, maybe it's hard to communicate the question, but uh, when, when you talk about the dissolution mm. into the... Mm. Um, this is some we, I, you got you must talk about things that I mean you is a tricky word but when we talk yeah uh, we talk about things that we've experienced yeah so so when you talk about that mm. how can you talk about it if there's no one to experience it so the of course in the moment of the experience. The same way that when we talk about dreams when we come back, you know, like, were you there doing it during the dream or weren't you there? Something happened and there's some kind of thread that comes back that we can carry and put in language. Is our language and expression exactly that? No, never. Anyway, in no case is our language that exactly that. Even when, even if I were talking about what I did yesterday and I bumped into some guy in town and he looked like this and like that, still my story is a, a fragment of, of a limited perception mm. so when coming back from these states then there then we like all experience we tend to make it our own and conceptualize it and try to ground it in language and like this but it is an experience that the that dissolution even though the egoic self is gone there's we no can say well this is uh, the the dissolving itself but once that which is dissolving is dissolved Right, and this is the thing is that they, one can dissolve like kind of partially or one can go into it and start mentalizing it or one can go, you know, so there's different depths to which we're able to let go and surrender. Now we're talking more about kind of the surrender and the grace because much of the path is this effort and trying. But once we get to that point, if the effort hangs on, then we're then it's not going to it's not going to flow. So it's so there is a a subtle dynamic and play between this like effort and hanging on and pushing and the surrender and based on our capacity to surrender and to let go then we will either get caught in the dissolving I mean many people for a long time it's just like being able to stay in the dissolving not that we come necessarily to the full point of dissolved but even a little bit of dissolving will be more dissolved than we are in our normal state and that will bring about such a release of energy that's been trapped in the densification of our physical body and our samskaras and our memories and our habits so even a even a mo a little bit of dissolving which is this kind of relaxing we talk about enlightenment as like the ultimate relaxing or like taking like the cosmic shit where it's just like ah oh, you know, like this, this just is like, ah. Oh. So even a glimpse of that dissolving 
but it, we, we can't say that it's fully dissolved or something. So there will be a, there is, the dissolving is an experience because it's a process of shifting. It's like me falling asleep. I'm, can I be aware of myself falling asleep? Up to a certain point. But then once the sleep hits, then it's up past a certain point. No, there's no more experience of falling asleep. Oh. And then and then you're just asleep. Or, you know, you could say asleep. Asleep but, or awake. Or asleep yeah. and awake at the same time in a certain way. Yes. But but is that, would you consider that an awake state if you're not even experiencing being? Being is experiencing itself. Being is expressing itself. That's the ultimate wakefulness. It's so, not, wakefulness is not, again, a personal state. And it's almost, it's that makes it impossible to talk about. Hmm. So if, 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 it's a, if it's not a personal state and being is experiencing itself, you could say that when we're not even here, you know, that after these bodies die, yeah. everything is awake. Everything is already awake right now. Even when the bodies are there some, simultaneously, that, that's, the, that's what they mean, that everyone is a Buddha. Everything is a Buddha. Everything is awake everything and we just awake. have to realize that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Everything is consciousness. Consciousness is inherently awake as being. Being is only, anyway, even in us, it's just being using itself to perceive itself. Do, do you think that this is a perspective or is it a, a, a fundamental truth of reality? Fundamental truth of reality. Huh. So, so the is, underlying truth of reality. Is awakening about... Um, <clears throat> becoming happier in terms of being like uh, happier in life or is it about realizing the truth of the universe realizing the truth of the universe which itself is happiness and contentment and peace and beauty and bliss and all of that it's just the, that remembering it's just a relaxing back into that which is again we're saying it it's that which is it always is can't be changed so all of the suffering in this, like when the Buddha talks and like this is, is created by our own imagination. So it's really quite simple. Everything is already awake and we just have to realize it. Yes. Yes. I think we should end on that. I think, that's yeah, perfect. that's probably enough. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.